Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, I yeah, here are my notes. I was looking oh, wow. through all my <laughs> notes and I, realizing that I have so many questions and there's so many okay. interesting Good. parts about the book and everything it, that I knew or thought I knew about Viking history and culture and everything. So who knows how much of this we'll, we'll get to here, but I'm, I'm really, yeah, curious about your personal process of putting mm -hmm. all this together, mm -hmm. but also and in the details on what we know about the grave site and what the controversy going on about that is, sure. if it is still going on. But I'm also interested in just the deep questions that this made me think about, mm -hmm. you know, how religion has been used as this sort of tool for power and how it's affected our view of history and uh, everything else about the sagas and the gods. And yeah, I have a lot of questions, but. Well, if you want to start with that one, you know, about religion, um, a good place to start is with the uh, Viking creation story. And that comes, uh, comes to us through Snorri Sturluson, comes through us, you know, to us through the Prosetta. So you can, you can, you know, clearly say we've got Icelandic roots to that story. Um, Snorri is not trustworthy as a source. You know, I wrote an earlier book called Song of the Vikings that is a biography of Snorri Sturluson. And I really tried to focus on him as a writer. And he's an absolutely fantastic writer. I mean, I'd, I'd fight anybody to, to prove that he is the greatest writer of the Middle Ages. He's you know, way more important than Shakespeare, I think. Um, but he was a pretty miserable person. Uh, he especially was very much a misogynist. He did awful things to the women in his life, you know, his mother, his wife, his mistresses, his daughters. I mean, he just, you know, wasn't the kind of person you wanted to live with or I want to live with. Um, and that, that bleeds into his work because when he wrote down the Norse myths in, in the Prosetta, he didn't tell us the stories of the goddesses. He didn't tell us much at all. He gave us their names, which tells us, you know, he knew stories. He just didn't share them with us. And when I was writing Song of the Vikings, I was trying to figure out like, why? Why didn't he write down those stories? And I realized I'm a writer. When you are writing something, you think of who's your audience and what's your purpose. That's like basic writing 101. You write for a certain audience and a certain purpose. So I thought, okay, what's Snorri's audience? His audience was a 16 year old king of Norway. Uh, raised this guy, by in a Christian culture. He was raised in a Christian culture. I mean, he was like totally controlled by the bishops. Uh, you know, he came to the throne at 14 and Snorri met him soon after that. And Snorri wanted to have an influential position at court. And the historical way that Icelanders have always had an important position at the Norwegian court was they were the court poet. They were the skald. And they were also the historian. They wrote the sagas of the kings. So Snorri is very, very good at that. And he goes to Norway and he wants to be the court poet. And suddenly he's faced with a 14-year-old king who knows nothing about Viking poetry. You know, hundreds of years worth of important stuff that fortunately Snorri saved for us. So he writes this book, the Prosetta, that includes lots of examples of Viking poetry and also the myths that you needed to understand them. But he's thinking about this in terms of educating a 16 year old boy. So he tells you about fast horses and magic yeah. swords <laughs> and ships that never sink and you know, great heroes. He couldn't care less about women. You know, unless they were, you know, Eve or Mary. So right. you have this, this very, you know, shaded picture. Now, Snorri does give us glimpses of the kind of stories that he leaves out. You know, for instance, when he describes Freya, the goddess of you know, love and fertility, he also tells us that she was a battle goddess and she claimed half of the slain and she rode to battle in a chariot pulled by a big cat. Now, most of the illustrations you've seen in books will give you a big pussycat. Now, I think of 
a mountain lion. Right. Okay, so yep. here's this warrior woman going to battle in a chariot that's drawn by a mountain lion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one that Snorri tells us about is Skadi, the goddess of, of winter and hunting. And the story he tells about her is just this, this terribly bawdy, funny story about you know, how she gets married. Um, but it starts with her father being killed by the gods. And she is going to avenge his death. So Snorri tells us she goes to Asgard, you know, the realm of the gods. She puts on her armor, she grabs up her weapons, and she challenges them to a duel. And they're all afraid to fight her. She's a giant woman, you know, and even Thor is not going to fight her. Yeah. So they offer her compensation instead. And, you know, the three things they offer her is, you know, they're going to make her father's eyes into stars. They're going to make her laugh, which apparently she's never done before. And they're going to let her marry one of the gods by picking him out by his feet. So, I mean, it's like, okay, Snorri turns it into a very funny story that a teenage boy would like. But the part that I see is this warrior woman going right. off to Asgard and everybody's afraid of him. And so he writes these things as if it's normal, as if... Yeah you know he mentions it but you still yeah he sort of is downplaying in the long run women's roles in this and leaving it seem like it was just in the, the fairy tale versions um that real also, women weren't doing that i mean he gives us like 12 other goddesses that he just gives you the name and you're going oh my gosh all these stories that go along with those names that we don't have anymore. I mean, yes, thank you very much, Snorri, that you wrote anything at all. I right. mean, we're very grateful for that, but oh, I wish you'd written book two. <laughs> right. Okay, so it's this fascination of understanding from your, I read Song of the Vikings and I mm -hmm. really loved that. And then this, the, the real Valkyrie added a whole lot to that. And I'm glad you kept bringing up Snorri as well, because it, it really yeah. helped me connect yeah. those two yeah. and think of these scholarly eras or these mm -hmm. times, right? So you have mm -hmm. the actual Viking age where we have a few grave sites to tell us what that was actually like. Then, you know, a few hundred years later, here's Snorri at sort of at the end of that Viking age in this beginning of oh, the Christian he's, age. He's pretty much well after it. Right. Um, right. The, the real Viking Age, the pagan Viking Age, ended around the year 1000. Right. When yeah. everybody in the Viking world by then was pretty much Christian, or they were very much affected by Christianity. Snorri doesn't come in for 200 years after that. Right. So, so Snorri is writing stuff down that is 200 years after people started practicing any sort of pagan religion. So he's, he's you know, really an like an antiquary. He's a historian, you know, right. pulling this stuff together. Right. But it's... I wanted to tell you the, the Norse creation story because, you know, that was, that was the point of this, this whole Snorri uh, um, digression. He does tell us this creation story. And I think it's really important for us to remember it. In the beginning, there are these two driftwood logs, an elm and an ash. And they're found on the seashore by two gods who are just taking a walk. The gods give the wood human shape and they bring it to life with blood, breath, and curious minds. Hmm. Now, unlike the Christian creation story, where Eve is an afterthought, you know, fashioned out of Adam's rib because Adam is lonely and Adam is made in the image of God, but Eve is made in the image of Adam. Mm -hmm. In the Norse myth, Embla, the woman, and Asker, the man, are made at the same time by the same gods for the same reasons and almost out of the same stuff. You have an ash tree and an elm tree. And so I thought, well, what are those woods used for? Well, ash wood was used for oars and the shafts of spears. And elm wood, I found out, was used for cartwheels and hunting bows. So both of these woods have uses in both peace and wartime. That's interesting. I think, you know, that's how we have to think of the men and women of the Viking Age. They were social equals and their roles in the society were not defined by their gender, but based on, you know, their own characteristics, their ability, their ambition, their family ties, you know, their wealth, you know, their opportunities, you know, things like that. Not specifically, you know, men on one side and women on the other. 
Right. And so and under- you can get that from Snorri if you read it. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Okay. And, and he, knowing his audience, he's trying to please mm-hmm. this young Christian King. It sort of, I don't know, justifies or explains why he wrote the way he did. Exactly. But, but then you have this time pass, right? Where not a whole lot is going on for new scholarship or perhaps it is, but then you focus in on the Victorian age where mm-hmm. the scholars of the 1800s are looking back at Snorri's work and the grave sites and interpreting that with their own biases. Exactly. So um, w- was the there whole, something in between those two phases between Snorri and, and the 1800s? A little. Like, yeah, the, the manuscripts were, were collected by Arnie Magnusson. Um, they, were, they were moved to Denmark, half of them burned up in the fire of Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them we have, we have paper copies of. Uh, periodically, they were published, you know, in, in Danish or Norwegian or Latin translations. One of them was even published in runes. Somebody rewrote, you know, a saga in runes, <laughs> which would have taken a lot of effort. <laughs> um, but they weren't, uh, there wasn't this sense of, you know, Viking studies. Uh, the, the stories were used more for a nationalistic purpose. Uh, the Grimm's brothers were very interested in them. The Grimm's brothers brought out what they called Germanic mythology, which essentially is Snorri turned into right. German. <laughs> you know, so it should have been called Norse mythology. Right. Um, but it wasn't until the 1800s where there was, you know, and, and this again was tied to nationalism. I mean, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark and Iceland all wanted to be independent. And so they all wanted to prove that they had you know, a long heritage, a long history as a nation. And so Snorri's works were, were uh, uh, rediscovered around that time. And then they were translated into English um, in the 1700s and the 1800s. And people got really excited about this, you know, Viking heritage and this you know, pan-Germanic, you know, mm. culture. And what we think of as Viking studies pretty much started you know, in the late 1800s, when they dug up the Viking ships. Right. And, you know, that was like, oh, my gosh, these are not just stories. We have artifacts now. We have Mm -hmm. ships. Um, And at the same time, I mean, the whole the whole science of archaeology was being developed then. So in the mid to late 1800s, the whole concept of uh, it being important to study the things and preserve the things that you dig up out of the ground that, you know, became a science. Uh, and and there, there started to be, you know, I, the guy who dug up the grave that is at the, at the heart of the real Valkyrie, the guy who was working on, on Birka in the late 1800s, he introduced the use of graph paper. I mean, just think about <laughs> trying to, do archaeology before craft paper. Yeah, what, what an know? innovation. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's, it's art. <laughs> you just draw what you see in the ground, but he yeah. actually now is doing it. You have to actually do it to scale. Huh. Um, you know, so things like that were happening and the science was being created. And if you think about the culture uh, all through Europe in the 1800s, you had this concept that you know, elite women were supposed to stay at home. You know, they were supposed to concern themselves with the kitchen, the children, and maybe the church. So those were the three things that you know, were appropriate for women. And the men were the professors and the scientists and the archaeologists and who were the translators and, and okay, the military the women, types. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, they they created this image that we have of the Viking world in their own image. Right. Which again, like we shouldn't be too surprised that they did that, I guess, but now with the benefit of new new technology and just better perspectives, Mm -hmm. I guess it makes perfect sense also that we're reanalyzing all of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So where do you think, is there any controversy that yet remains about is the grave actually a woman or are these new developments worth having? You know, when you just Google Burka Viking warrior woman, there's a Wikipedia yeah. page for that. Right. And it mentions right. that, you know, it's still somewhat contested or, or something. And if you go on YouTube, mm-hmm. there's some people diving in all supportive of this new way of looking at it and other people's kind of 
putting up a lot of resistance to it and a lot of people in the middle as well. So I'm curious, I mean, I'm kind of biased on your side. I just read your book and I feel That's like you point. probably made a great <laughs> argument, but well, uh, what, what do you think? Let's back up a little. Um, you know, the, the real Val in the real Valkyrie, you know, what I'm doing is I'm recreating the life and times of this one warrior in the Viking age. And she happens to be a woman. Now I have background as a science writer and in medieval literature. So I like to combine science and history and literature in my books. I thought that this was going to be a book about bones. I thought that the important thing about this grave when I first learned about it in, in 2017 was what do these new scientific technologies tell us about bones that were dug up out of the ground a hundred years ago? I mean, what can we now find out that we couldn't find out in you know, the 1890s? So that was what I thought was interesting. Well, then, like you said, the backlash hit. And I realized that this was going to be a book about bias. So, yeah. you know, a little background. It's storytelling and yeah. So this, this um, Birka Grave 581, uh, it was excavated in 1878. It was one of 1,100 graves that this one archaeologist excavated on the island of Birka in Sweden. It's about a couple hours boat ride from Stockholm. With dynamite, as you described in the book. Yeah, he, 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 dynamite was a new technology then, the way, way DNA testing is now. Right. Um, it was invented in Sweden, so you know mm. he, he had access to the best stuff. Okay. Um, and what he used it for was that there was a big stone marking this grave. And he didn't have any other technology to move that stone, so he blew it up. Mm -hmm. But he didn't actually blow up the whole grave. I mean, he didn't right. scatter the bones. He, right. he, he had a controlled explosion. Right. Um, it still was pretty scary when I read that. It's like, oh, my gosh, he used dynamite <laughs> on an archaeological site? I mean, right. today Risky. the archaeologists that I'm working with, you know, they get the same reaction when they say they want to bring a bulldozer to the site. It's like, okay, what? Okay. You're going to bring a bulldozer on right. the site? Yeah. But if you know how to use it, you know, you can use the technology, you can do it, you know, carefully. Mm -hmm. So when he dug this uh, grave up, what, you know, what he found and, and you know, what we can see now in, in the drawings is the warrior was buried seated. And we think now that it was on a saddle because of where the position of the stirrups are. There were two horses buried with this warrior, and horses are extremely valuable. There was hardly any burials at Burka that have two horses. There's not mm -hmm. very many that have one. So this is a very rich person, rich burial. Yep. And surrounding this warrior, there's like every weapon known in the Viking age. Here's this, a sword. There's this long knife called a scramasax. There's a sheaf of arrows with with a special head on them for piercing armor. Uh, there was probably a bow because there's a blank spot next to the arrows. Uh, there's an ax, there's two spears, there's two shields. And then on the warrior's lap, there is um, probably in a bag, a complete set of pieces for a board game that we kind of call Viking chess and is really called Nevatop in, in Icelandic. Um, and then as I said, there was this big stone over the grave marking it. And the position of the grave was on like the westernmost promontory of this plateau on which the warrior's hall was built right outside of the fortress of Birka. So whoever this person was in the grave, uh, the people of the warrior's hall knew uh, the warrior was being buried there and honored that person in, in a very specific way. Right. So like for a hundred years, this is the ultimate Viking warrior burial. Right. It's in all the textbooks. This is the war leader as they call him, her. Right. <laughs> so, you know, in uh, 2017, there's this group of researchers uh, in Uppsala and Stockholm, and they are going through all of the bones that they can from the Birka uh, excavations and they're applying new uh, testing techniques to them. So they did DNA testing, they did isotope testing of the teeth, you know, and, and, you know, trying to find out things like, what did these people eat? Where were they born? You know, what can we find out about them? Are any of them related? And lo and behold, here, this ultimate Viking warrior turns out to be female. 
whoops. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like uh, they were probably really surprised and they right. went back and they very, very carefully checked everything. Yeah. And they published in a very reputable scholarly journal, um, you know, after a lot of checking, a lot of peer reviewing. And they thought, wow, this is going to change the way we talk about you know, women's status in the Viking age. Well, um, it changed it a little in ways that they hadn't really expected because even some of the people that they had collaborated with in the past, you know, scholars who knew them said, you must have made a mistake. This can't mm -hmm. possibly be true. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we checked this. We checked everything. And it got to the point where they published a longer article in 2019 in the journal Antiquity you know, describing everything about the grave and, and, you know, the location and the artifacts and everything that made them think that this is a warrior and it's a woman. Um, you know, I was really kind of scared when that uh, 2019 paper came out because I thought, I mean, I was, I was well into writing this book and I'm like, <laughs> oh no, they're going to walk it back. You know, wow. they're not going to, they're not, <laughs> but they didn't. They, they said, they kind of doubled down. This is a woman. And we would be very surprised if she was alone in the mm. Viking world. Right. So it's like, do you accept the results of modern science when it flies in the face of what you've been taught and, you know, what you believe? And, and even for me, you know, the hardest thing about writing this book is that I published a book in 2006 on a Viking woman, the far traveler. Uh, this was the Icelandic woman, Gudrýdr Thorbjörnardóttir, who went to North America. And I made a pretty strong case for her having organized the expedition and for owning one of the ships and being, you know, the, one of the leaders. And yet I still had her pretty much in the standard Viking woman role where she took care of the cows, she made the clothing, she made the cheese, you know, she got married, she did what her father told her. Right. And as I'm writing this book, I'm thinking, how do I know that stuff? Interesting. How right. do I know that? And you, know? you were just using the best information you had available exactly. and you were trusting yeah. the scholarly community mm -hmm. that it was. So, wow. Yeah. If even you can be you know, fooled or, or, you know, fall into that natural assumption Absolutely. kind of explains why everyone else has been for so long too. It, it does. And, and, you know, every time I would see something now that I, I wanted to put in the real Valkyrie, I'd have to say, do I know that? Or do I just think I know that? Mm -hmm. Like, where did this come from? You know, right. I, yeah. It's, it's really hard to, to, you know, separate what we think is a known fact about the Viking age from what was an assumption made in the mid 1800s that has just remained in the textbook since then. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Hard. <laughs> it's hard. And it's, it's a little scary also to like suddenly yeah. think like, what else do we need to re question or re understand? Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we celebrate Vikings as being Vikings? Is it weird when my little cousins are like four years old or like have a, toy axe and are like killing their dad for fun and it's like <laughs> vikings were slavers as you go into great detail yeah. about and it's like the whole thing is kind of rough right and uh so we think it's cool to acknowledge it from a historical perspective of course but how, how does it cross the line for you and are we romanticizing them by by naming a football team after them and <laughs> stuff like that? Or do you find it to be uh, appropriately done? Well, I think if you look at the world around, you know, before the year 1000, you know, the, the period that I'm looking at is the, you know, 900 to 1000, you're not gonna find anybody in Europe that you could celebrate as being a good person. It's a great point. Um, Go, you know, go another hundred years back, Charlemagne. Okay. Should we say Charlemagne was a great king? He, he massacred like 2000 Germans, you know, who didn't want to become Christian. He just killed them all. They had surrendered. He killed them. Uh, you know, if you, if you just look at what life was like back in that time, uh, it was pretty brutal and, um, 
Yeah, so. yeah. There, there, there might be one or two people who you could put up on a pedestal, but the, the general, you know, the I guess the point I'm trying to make is the Vikings weren't any worse than their neighbors. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I do make that point in in one of the chapters where I talk about how the Irish, you know, won one of the battles and immediately um, enslaved all the Vikings. And mm -hmm. then when the Vikings won the battle, they enslaved all the Irish. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they were, both sides were just as bad. Right, um, right. So now, uh, should we celebrate people who go around with axes and bash other people over the head? Yeah, probably not. Um, but we do <laughs> but, yeah but at the same it's maybe it's almost like a necessary evil to some extent if we want people in the culture to understand this history and to to think it's interesting at all right like because my cousins when they're four years old they may not understand everything but like they are developing an understanding of this history and when they're a little <laughs> older they can process the consequences I mean, the bad stuff about it as well and do children play with guns right yeah, that's. I mean, that's even if you I don't let them it. have a physical gun, they're going to go around with their fingers and shoot you. Uh huh. Um, that's do, kind of the same. Does anybody in modern society like to play uh, video games? You know, where they're the the shooter. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know, we we have this aggressive side. We we really can't pretend that we don't. And I think if we. Um, you know, if we romanticize the Vikings and their big axes, that's not any worse than romanticizing a policeman or, or you know, a, a marine uh, or a pirate uh, or, yeah. Um, you do hope that you teach your children when it's appropriate to hit somebody with an axe and when it's right, not. Right. And so in that <laughs> but, case, you maybe shouldn't read the sagas because uh, Egil's mother, he was like five years old when he killed his first enemy right, in, a, in right. a ball game. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It's a very different society than the one we live in. Right. Um, you know, the, the Vikings thought that their death was ordained uh, when they were born. You know, it was already decided when they were going to die. They, they have no control over how long they live. The only thing they have control over is how well they live and how well they die. So you always wanted to make the decision not to be safe, but to have glory. Mm. You know, it's, your, your death isn't going to get you any sooner if you mm. don't take risks. Okay. So, um, you know, that's, that was one of the things that led them to, you know, the explorations they did. It's like, you may as well, because yeah. you're going to die at home on mm. that certain day, or you're going to die at sea on that certain day. Interesting. Um, Gives you know, them a is, bit of courage that way. Exactly. Huh. You know, and, and also going into battle is probably why they were such great fighters. You know, okay. it's not because they thought it was going to be fun in Valhalla. It's like, you're going to die today, whether you fight or not. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Well, you're not, me... or you're going to be okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I definitely want to ask you more about Valhalla. Um, sure. I reading your books, I feel like I had to correct some misunderstandings I had about it, misconceptions mm -hmm. about it. I kind of used to see it as like, yeah, heaven for warriors, like some other religions have, like. You just mm -hmm. go out in a blaze of glory and then you get to live forever in paradise with all the gods feasting and stuff. But you sort of explained how Valhalla is not necessarily an eternal state. It's like the gods knew they were going to die and they were living in Valhalla anyway. And uh, you made that distinction that the Norse gods were different from, say, the Greek gods and that mm -hmm. the Norse gods knew they were their time was going to end eventually. Am I paraphrasing? Yeah, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's very much like the, the conception that the people in the Viking age had that, you know, they were going to die and they couldn't control when that was going to happen. Uh, in all of the myths, Odin and Thor know that they are going to be defeated in the last battle at Ragnarok. Yeah. Um, so the point of Valhalla is to gather to them all the best warriors on earth so that those warriors can fight for Odin and Thor in the last battle. And Even though they know they're going to lose. Well, they know they're going to lose, but maybe some of the other gods will survive. Maybe okay. something 
will survive. Okay. And, you know, in the prophecy, there are some of the gods, one of, you know, uh, Odin's sons who survives and, you know, Baldur comes back. And, and so there is a, a, you know, a renewal of the earth and a renewal of, of you know, the gods' homes. Um, but, yeah. you know, Valhalla isn't, I mean, Valhalla is just one, one house, one hall in the, you know, the gods' realm of Asgard. Right. Freya has her own. I mean, Freya's hall of Folkvanger is where other warriors go. And we don't know, you know, what their role is in the battle. Right. And, you know, Loki is also gathering an army of the dead. So people, you know, who die in different ways end up in Loki's army. <laughs> and, right. you know, fighting against their friends who uh -huh. are in, you know, Odin's army. So, so. Um, this is a... <sighs> I think somebody described it as um, a, a, a religion of bitter courage mm. because you go in there knowing you're going to lose, mm. you know, you go in there knowing eventually it's all going to end, but you do it anyway. Interesting. So would you yeah. say this is the general mindset that people in the Viking age had that the Viking people had um, about the meaning of life and their role in the universe and everything. They, they had this conception. So then transitioning into Snorri's phase, it was really mm -hmm. interesting how you explained how he personally liked the God Odin and was trying to like get Odin popularized again, because he sort right. of represented a King like God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who wasn't tied to a specific region of say Iceland or right. anywhere, but was like the God of gods. So he was thinking like, all right, if we can get that one popularized again, the people will be willing to accept a King uh, or like one powerful me on top of everyone. Well, and also because Odin is the God of poets and storytellers. Mm. And those are things that Snorri is very good at. Right. You know, he's not going to be promoting Thor because Snorri was not a big, strong guy, right, you know, right. who could, who could you know, hold uh, up against anybody else who has an ax. No. Mm -hmm. When it came to fighting, Snorri was the one who left the battlefield. You know, he just right. ran. Um, so he likes the God who is more like him. Right. The, the one who's crafty and smart. And, and he wants other people to like that God so that they will also like him. Exactly. They will, they will trust him to be the leader of their, their nation. But he really did want to be king. So it was in the year 1000 when the law speaker I, I threw the tablets into the waterfall. And <laughs> I don't know if it was that. I don't that remember that one. No, uh, he he put the I, cloak over his head and he, he decided that you know, we have to have one religion if we're going to have one law. Right. And, you know, he saw the future was going to be Christian. I mean, all their trading partners were Christian. There was, you know, really no way you could avoid it by that point. As a matter um, of politics. and That's uh, politics. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and, you know, he clearly did say, you know, what you do in your own home, I don't want to know about. So it wasn't that the old ways were completely uh, denied. It took probably a hundred years before the the hierarchy came to to Iceland to establish the church and another hundred years before the church really got control. Um, you know, even in Snorri's own lifetime, right, there were these right. arguments about who could marry whom and the church trying to break up marriages that were, you know, too, too close in, in, in bloodline. I mean, and they're talking about being related like five generations, seven generations back. And that was too close. Mm. Uh, so it was a power play and, you know, making a, a marriage wasn't valid unless it was done at a church and, and a child was not legitimate unless they were baptized. And, you know, so the church was really in the 1200s in Snorri's lifetime was really uh, establishing control and, over yeah, the country. Co-opting their pagan beliefs to support the new mm -hmm. Christian mm -hmm. doctrine. Right. Yeah. So I wonder what Snorri would say about all this today. Uh, have you, have you thought about that? Like if, if he could see how his works were immediately interpreted, I mean, he knew what was going on in his lifetime yeah. and he ended up being, you know, persecuted and killed, uh, tracked down in the very end. Uh, 
But like, um, what do you think he would say how the people in the 1800s interpreted his works and then how t- today people are interpreting his works? Do you think he would be surprised? I, I'm not or? really, yeah, well, maybe he'd be surprised, but I don't think Snorri would really care how they would interpret it. He would just like the attention. Uh-huh. He would like the fact that, you know, I mean, in Song of the Vikings, I trace the entire genre of modern fantasy to his works. So you wouldn't have the Lord of the Rings. You wouldn't have Game of Thrones. You know, you wouldn't have a Harry Potter if you didn't have Snorri Sturluson. Right. So right. he would love that. I mean, he would Maybe, love uh, knowing yeah. that he was the founder of, you know, this big part of modern culture. Yeah. Um, and he'd only... probably be very rich, you know, <laughs> yes. from it. You know, he'd be pulling in the royalties and he wouldn't care if you liked it or not. You know, he, he really was <laughs> he'd not. He'd take the a, power. Yeah, I mean, he, he was not a, a, a deep thinker, I don't think. He's not a philosopher. He's a storyteller. Right. You know? So in a lot of ways, he really is like the Vikings of the Viking Age. He wasn't a fighter, but he was like Egil, uh, the, the, the smart one and the poet mm-hmm. and the politician. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, but he also probably ruthless. wrote that saga. I mean, he probably wrote that saga. <laughs> so the connection between the two of them is not an accident. Right. You know, we don't really know if, you know, Eo was such a great poet, except that Snorri made him that way. Right. Interesting. So, wow. That's how you rewrite history, right? Absolutely. He had the advantage being the first person to ever write any of that history down. <laughs> so, of course. Well, actually, he wasn't because uh, some of the sagas that he wrote that are in Heimskringla, we have earlier versions of those same sagas that have almost all the same little plot points. That were written except- down. They were written down and we can compare, you know, the version of, uh, I think it's uh, Olaf the Saint and, you know, Snorri's version. And Snorri took out a lot of the religious stuff. You know, he shaded things differently. Uh, he, you know, he made the characters much more interesting. He, he streamlined the plot. I mean, he was an excellent writer, but he didn't make things Completely. I mean, he was working from other sources, mm-hmm. some of which we still have in writing. So, you know, we would still have had some history of Norway if he hadn't done his work. It just probably would not be anything you'd want to read and nobody <laughs> yeah. would care. You know, right. it's like you wouldn't have this you, you wouldn't have this idea of, of Vikings as being you know, sexy as mm-hmm. as as a people that you'd want to learn about if you didn't have the stories the way Snorri told them. Right. They would I just mean, be he, another one of these people, groups of people that most yeah. of us have never heard of. If you've uh, never heard of, past. I know. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of medieval chronicles and things that you could read about, you know, the Goths and the Huns and the Burgundians and, you know, the, you know, all of those, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. I mean, we have, in, we have information about them, but they don't have that, that flavor that Snorri because gave of the stories, the sagas. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, really, if you look at, you know, before Snorri and after Snorri, you can really see that he was the one who established that style. And the sagas that were written by his nephews, probably, or by the people who lived with him, you know, all have that, you know, special characterization, you know, that character. I mean, the, the plot, the setting, the characters, it's like historical novels. It's, it's way more modern than anything else you're going to find in, in, you know, the right. Middle Ages. I, I really like the, 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 this is on the front of the back of your book, the song of the Vikings, where you say like the most important writer of the time wasn't right. Chaucer or Shakespeare or whatever that, that like really yeah. got my attention right away. Yeah. It's like, Oh wow. Okay. Like I, I definitely want to check that out. Well, it's like, I mean, I lived that. I started out in college interested in Tolkien actually and, you know, they wouldn't let me study Tolkien because, you know, fantasy is just a genre and, and it's not important. This was in the 1970s. You mm. can't do that as a, an English major or even comparative literature. Mm. Um, so I said, well, what did Tolkien study? Well, he studied medieval literature. So I started reading all that stuff, you know, okay. Gawain in the Green Knight, the Arthurian legends, uh, Chaucer, Dante, you know, all these, these great writers. And then I read a saga. 
I read Yellow Sock. I said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just blew everything else out of the water. And yeah. I said, are there more of these? You know, and I, I just read every single one I could find in translation. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting them through interlibrary loan. Then they ran out and I learned Old Norse. I said, well, there are more. I can't read the language yet, but I will. So wow. I learned Old Norse. I started reading them in Old Norse. I even started translating a few, you know, and I'm like, how come people don't know about this stuff? This stuff is so good. Yeah. <laughs> and, wow. and I mean, it just, it, it's, it's so much more realistic than what you have in, in most other medieval literature. Right. I, and, when I, when I read my first saga, I, I hadn't read uh, all those other authors really. So mm -hmm. I didn't know what to expect at all. And I was kind of shocked and confused to some extent uh, just not knowing what to expect. It's like, at first it's like a long list of names right, then there's right. some action scenes and then like someone dies. And <laughs> now we're on to the grandson of that person. I was like, wait, okay. So we're just moving on, but they have the same name. So it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm very excited to reread the sagas now that I've read these two books of yours because it, it's put everything into more perspective for me, I'm sure. So I'll kind of know well, what to expect. One of the things that was surprising to me was that some of the sagas that I've always thought were stupid and useless and we shouldn't bother reading these, we shouldn't bother translating them. These are the ones that have women warriors mm. in them. These are the ones that feature women warriors. Mm. And I'd been like so brainwashed by my literature professors saying, but these aren't realistic. You know, they have dragons in them. These aren't realistic. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, not being able to study Tolkien because it's a genre. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you re recalibrate your brain and you decide that, okay, women warriors are not the same as dragons. Mm -hmm. Women warriors could be real. Dragons really are not. Yeah. Um, then you start reading these sagas again and you say, wow, this is giving me a completely different vision mm. of what's possible, you know, for women. And yeah, I mean, there's some stupid stuff in it. There's, there's a lot <laughs> that you can say couldn't have happened or is romanticized or is, is, you know, reflects the, the influence of French, you know, Arthurian romances that was coming into Iceland at the time these sagas were being written. Yeah, I can right. see that. I studied that stuff. Um, but I also see that these women warriors are presented very realistically. Mm -hmm. The people in the saga are never surprised that it's a woman. Right. I mean, they're not like, oh, wow, how did a woman get here? No, they say she was a woman, you know, and she, she did this. You know, and... She had this great sword. And yeah. if you guys <laughs> try to fight her, you're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like the king says this. He says, no, you may not go after her and get vengeance because look at the sword she's got. <laughs> yeah. Obviously she can use it. <laughs> right. I don't want to lose more of you. Right. So, you know, it's like, how do the people in the story relate to these <clears throat> characters? And, and, you know, they relate to them the way they would relate to a, a male hero. Right. Okay. So um, I really liked the, the fictional parts of your book, you know, where you're, Good. It's like you're port. It's like giving examples on how full-time fiction writers could start better depicting women in their stories and stuff, right? Oh wow! So, okay, I hadn't I thought mean, of it sort of as a handbook, but well, yeah, I'm, I'm doing uh, my. I, I'm channeling Snorri Sturluson. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> it's like this is how he wrote. He had facts. He had stories that he got from you know reputable sources, and then he filled in the gaps. He made up dialogue. Yeah, right. You know, he uh -huh. made up dialogue. He, <laughs> he described people he'd never seen that lived 400 years before. So right. I'm like, okay, you know, he can do it. So can I. Mixing I was elements, also yeah. thinking of, you know, if you look at modern documentaries these days, you know, they'll, they'll spend some time interviewing the experts and then they'll bring in actors dressed in period costume to, yep. you know, enact the scene so that mm -hmm. you can really fix it in your brain. And I thought, you know, I can do that in words. So what do you think about like the TV show Vikings and popular depictions yeah. of it? Do you think they do a good job reflecting women specifically or any of it uh, in general? And like, where do you see these things changing if, if the conception of Viking warrior women does continue to change? Well, I really like Ligertha. 
in the uh, the History Channel's Viking show. And in fact, she was one of the people that inspired this book because when that uh, program started, you know, I, I I was already you know a Viking specialist, and I thought, oh no, it's going to be awful. Right. They're going to get everything wrong. <laughs> And, you know, as I watched the first episode, you know, with trepidation yeah. and the very first scene, you know, it's the, the Vikings and the ship, the big guys with the beards, you know, and the big axes and they're burning down the houses and they're running through the town, killing people. And the, the camera focuses in on this beautiful blonde woman and her little children. And she says to the children, run and hide. And you're going, oh God, you know, yeah. we're going to start with the rape scene, you know, it's yeah. going to be so cliche. Yeah. And these two big guys come in and they start threatening her. And she picks up the poker from the fire and she just beats the crap out of them. You know, <laughs> okay. and it's just so this you were a little surprised. whole fight scene. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did they just do? I mean, <laughs> they just flipped the tables on our expectations. Wow. Yeah. And it was, it's very clear. I mean, Catherine Winnick, who, who plays that role, is a martial artist. Hmm. And, you know, she had all the moves. And these two big hairy guys, they didn't. You know, they, were, they thought that they were tall and strong, and so they could over, overwhelm this little woman. And she's like, no, I know what I'm doing, and you guys don't. I, and I just thought, okay, you know, from now on, this series can make all the mistakes it wants <laughs> because they've got me. It's got some know? goodwill right, right they've off got the bat. Me. Yeah. But, you know, it's that sort of thing where you just have to, to take our expectations and, and shake them up and say, why not? And right. when I started writing this book, I mean, I went through Saxo Grammaticus. He was another one of my sources in addition to Snorri. He, mm-hmm. he and Snorri were, were pretty much contemporaries. Saxo was writing in the early you know, maybe 20 years before Snorri, just around the year 1200. Saxo describes Lagertha almost exactly the way she appears in this film. Wow. You know, yeah. it's, it's just like, oh, we just didn't take Saxo seriously. Right. You know? we, li- we listened too much to the people who came exactly. in the Victorian era. Well, and Saxo himself says, I shouldn't be writing about women like this. I mean, they, they are unnatural. And yet he tells the story. You know, right. <laughs> and, and it's like, wow, okay, there really was a woman who did this sort of stuff. Right. And right. Ragnar Lothbrok, you know, gives her the credit for saving him and, you know, winning the battle and, and everything. So it's like, oh, you know, back in, you know, the time, this wasn't that unusual. You know? right. It wasn't completely, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, of course, every woman didn't do this. I mean, every woman doesn't join the Marines now. Every woman is an Olympic athlete. You know, every woman doesn't run the Boston Marathon. I mean, these are, these are women who have a certain drive and a certain you know, physical excellence and a certain, you know, ambition. Right. Yeah. And like you said at one point, something about Herver, the name for your mm-hmm. fictionalized person we're talking about, uh, it was lucky that she lived in a time where it was only unusual for women to be Vikings and not when it was absolutely unnatural or even exactly. later where it was like exactly. impossible and like unheard of. Uh, yeah. And uh, that, that pretty much started in the 1200s. So yeah. when, you know, when Snorri and Saxo are writing, you know, there are people in other countries who are, who are really um, rewriting history to try to explain what these women are doing on the battlefield. And their answer is, oh, she must have been a witch. And she was spreading this magic power powder on the battlefield. It's like, no, she's a countess. She's leading her troops. Right. You know? Th- that's a more simple explanation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, there's, um, there's, you know, Ethelflaed in, in England <clears throat> who, you know, was leading her troops and, and uh, organizing the battles and, and making the strategy. And fortunately, we have two versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, <laughs> the one who leaves her out and the one who gives her credit. You know, yeah. So it's, it's not just in the Viking world that, that, that there were women warriors. It's just that that part of history got written out of the story because women aren't supposed to do that sort of thing. Right. <clears throat> so we kind of understand Snorri's bias trying to influence this young Christian king. We kind of understand the people in the Victorian age, their bias just, well, okay, maybe not. Like, do you think 
that era of scholarship and and the continuing controversy today about this like are they, are these some of these were they being intentionally dismissive just because they just didn't want to believe that that stuff or is it were they just working with the best information they had and what they grew up learning about values and they honestly thought this is what happened no i think you have to ask uh, men today um do they think there should be a woman president is a woman qualified to be president of the united states i mean what kind of answers are you going to get i mean we, <laughs> yeah, we, we know, saw in one of the elections the kind of answers that we got <clears throat> um, but that, that mindset, you know, hasn't gone away. And in Snorri's time in the 1800s, that was the you know, standard accepted mindset. I mean, there were scientists who worked very hard and still do to prove that women are not capable of doing everything that men are capable of doing. Um, so I think it's mostly, you know, how you're brought up and how you're educated and what you see in the society around you and that defines what is appropriate for a man or a woman to do and what yeah. is conceivable, what is natural. And then the opposite is unnatural. And, mm -hmm. and really, even Tolkien had a very, very hard time conceiving of a woman warrior. You know, mm -hmm. it, he didn't have too many of them. In his books, you know, right. even yeah. though he's read all the same stuff I have, right. you know, and you know, one of the one of the big complaints or criticisms of his work is that there aren't very many women, right, there. Well, there aren't that many women in Snorri either. So if Tolkien's working off Snorri, and you know, what do you expect? Right. Um, <laughs> I can yeah. I can appreciate Snorri's work as a writer. I can appreciate Tolkien's work as a writer, and overlook, you know, their lack of interest or lack of understanding of women mm -hmm. because yeah. you know that was a society they grew up in mm -hmm. um one thing i pulled from your book that i found interesting was you explained the history of the word book or boke yeah. and scrifa to to write you explain how those words actually boke meant tapestry not so much book and mm -hmm. scrifa didn't mean to write but to weave and to weave a tapestry and you explain how these old tapestries told stories and it was yeah. the women who made the tapestries. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you I, think of, you know, what did people do before they could read in, in every culture we know, they made pictures yeah. that had stories. And mm -hmm. so this was the, you know, the Viking version of that was to weave the tapestries that told the stories. And, you know, now the few fragments of them that we have, we look at them and we say, wow, what story could that be? And, scholars who study this, you know, intensively come up with completely different stories, mm -hmm. you know, for the same little bit of tapestry. Um, so right. it's really hard for us to know what was meant, but back in the time, it probably would have been obvious. Uh huh. And then when the sagas, the, which the first thing I knew about sagas was that saga meant like to speak, it was spoken before it was yeah, ever written. Okay. So it's like, that, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And how you explain what a, what a king really needed to be remembered was a tapestry and a, a song or a saga right. to kind of go yeah. with it. And mm -hmm. then people would remember it throughout the generations and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's funny how those words have changed a lot. Uh, and how we how they went from being only spoken things and just pictures mm -hmm. and then to words and then to yeah books and it's like this wild telephone game right throughout almost you know yeah 1500 years or more and people <laughs> trying to interpret what was meant before based on what they think they know now and Mm -hmm. It's a messy. I guess this is just history, right? Maybe, maybe the Viking yeah. age isn't special. Words always change their meanings, you know, and, <laughs> right. and take on new meanings as new technologies come come along. Yeah, so uh, it's really curious to see how the coming generations and next couple hundred years will continue to remember these stories or preserve them. Uh, do you have any uh, predictions on on what might be learned uh, in the in the future? Uh, more scientific research on the artifacts we have will tell us more or more interpretation of the old texts we still have already um well i think i think absolutely every generation is going to reinterpret um you know what we have uh 
you know, my parents could not have imagined that you and I would be speaking over this uh, technology that we're using right now. Yeah. But I would be, you know, watching you in your studio in a different time zone, and you would be looking at the books on my shelf, yeah. you know, and we would be having this discussion that you are later going to edit and present, you know, yeah. on what what is the internet you know how do you describe that to people who uh, never you know never experienced it mm -hmm. um in the 1870s when this grave that i i feature was dug up they didn't know what dna was they didn't know that there was any possible way of taking a tiny little shard of bone or one tooth and saying this is a woman i mean that would have been total fantasy to them. They would have thought that we were entirely nuts. So yeah. in a hundred years, there's going to be another technology that is like Zoom or DNA or the internet. And we are going to, you know, you know, if you, if we live that long, are not going to be able to believe it. We're not, you know, we can't imagine it. No yeah. Like it is so in the future. I mean, science right. fiction writers did imagine the, the, the picture phone. I mean, and you know that's that's sort right. of a, a next stage, right? I guess. So what's so next? Be, now? Yeah, we'll be able yeah. to smell and feel each other or something, you know, yeah. <laughs> or, or or you know, or exchange places even. Um, but right. one of the things archaeologists are very aware of, and that you know, I learned when I was doing uh, the Far <clears throat> Traveler, is that they realize that digging something up out of the ground destroys evidence. You know, once you take that skull out of the grave, you can't ever see it in the grave again. You can mm -hmm. never dig it up again. It's now in a box in a museum. So you can't put it back in its context. You can, you can have pictures of it. You can have drawings of it. You can have data. You can have everything, but you can't put it back. Yeah. So, for instance, the, the house of Gudryder Thorbjörnardottir at Glumbeyer in Iceland, which was where the archaeology was done that I, I wrote about in The Far Traveler, they have not dug up that house yet mm. because they know it's there. It is not in any danger of, of being destroyed by erosion or by somebody building a summer house there. Mm -hmm. And they know that in 50 years, in 100 years, we will have these new techniques that will tell us so much more. Right. Okay. And so there's an active pursuit to leave things in the ground for leave now. Leave it in the ground unless it is in danger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what people in Iceland and, and in other countries are focusing on, you know, you don't have unlimited money to do archaeological digs. So what they want to do is is rescue the stuff that is eroding out of the cliffside, you know, in Orkney, you know, because of sea level rise. They want to rescue the stuff that was discovered when a road was being built in Norway, and that road is going to go through. So they got to take the stuff out of the ground, uh, or a house is being built, or a museum is being built. <clears throat> you know, they they dig a foundation for something, they come up with bones. Well the archaeologists run right in, yeah. um, you know, and, and so we found some really, really important stuff that way, but that has to be the, you know, the sites that we focus on rather than just, you know, something that's not at risk. You know, right. Like, right. You know, it's and like, well, I'd really like to dig up Skalholt and find out if, you know, there was any ivory working done there you know that was the focus of another one of my books okay uh, were the lewis chess men made in iceland it's like yeah they would have been made at skalholt by this woman margaret who was an ivory carver and i'd really like to dig up that spot <laughs> yeah but yeah. there's no reason to right you know it's like yeah i'd like to know that's not good enough yeah okay <laughs> so you know one of my final questions and thoughts uh, reflecting on all of this is about the the non-eternal nature of all of these kingdoms and and of mm -hmm. societies and cultural shifts and stuff like i wonder the people who buried herver if mm -hmm. they thought that her grave would be there forever if that row of kingly graves would just extend and extend and it could go on for thousands of years they would live that way and do those things uh, did they ever expect that 
these graves would be dug up and their whole society would be kind of gone. Um, Actually, I think they probably did because they did that to the people who came before them. Hmm. Um, pretty much every grave that you, you know, study in the Viking age, your big mound has been dug into. Right. And, you know, some of the most impressive ones were pretty much destroyed, you know, a hundred years or 200 years after uh, the burial, the next kingdom comes in and takes all the, all the goodies out of it. Um, sometimes even, they, they leave enough that it's still interesting to us. And sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes these, these were even leveled. You know, for instance, I, I write about the, the uh, town of Kalpong in Norway in this book. And there's the great hall above the town was actually built on top of a grave, on top of a burial mound that they just flattened, you know, used the dirt and put the hall up there. So they knew there was somebody important buried there. And they went, oh, sorry, this is now where I'm going to put my, my hall. Yeah. Um, so wow. I think the Vikings were aware that, you know, this is not going to last forever. I mean, right. they didn't know that it was going to last as long as it did for, before we actually came in and dug things up. Right. I mean, I think they also realized that most of the things you put in the ground don't last. You know, that's the whole point of burying things. They, they rot. Make them go away. Yeah. <laughs> they go away. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah. I, I think they understood that, you know, time was a circle. Right. Uh, there, would be, there would be a new, you know. A new kingdom yeah. coming even, in. Even Herver, as you describe her, and the Herver from the sagas robbed mm -hmm. her own father's grave, right? Yeah. So it's like, yeah. yeah, she must have known that if she were buried, her grave could be somebody, robbed as well. Well, she shouldn't take that sword to the grave, you know? She should give it to somebody first, which she does in the saga. Okay, but, yeah. You know, yeah, um, that was pretty standard to actually open the graves and take out the heirlooms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it's actually her that I would love to know if, uh, if the person buried in that grave could read your book right now and <laughs> I say, you got it all wrong. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine if someone did that to you, you know, like yeah, right. a, a thousand years I'm after you died. Cremated. <laughs> it won't be that option. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I was having this discussion with my sister about graves and stuff and they have been very valuable for historic history mm -hmm. sake. Right. And so fewer people maybe are being buried today than, than used to be, or um, I don't know. Maybe well, actually, that's a, they're, too bad. they're really only, only useful before Christianity because, because Christian people, even in the middle ages in, in the Viking age, you know, were not buried with stuff. Right. It was just their body maybe in their own clothes, but usually just wrapped in a, in a sheet, you know, so it's a naked body wrapped in a sheet, stuck in the ground, maybe with a, with a cross, maybe, in, uh, maybe, but tell maybe you much. not, you know, you know, it's just, it, it wasn't considered right in, in, in a lot of the different uh, uh, communities to bury them with anything at all, you know, so not even their clothing, not even their jewelry. You know, but then in their other communities, they were buried in their best clothes. So they, they might have been buried with their jewelry and their right. you know, clothing or a Bible or, you know, the bishop with his crozier and that kind of thing. So it was, you know, dependent on the community. But sure. uh, it was not at all like the, the, you know, the vast, you know, graves that that uh, you have in part of the Viking Age. No, not right. everybody got so. those, of course. You know, the slaves didn't get them. <laughs> right, right. Only the uh, rich people. Mm hmm. Uh, so yeah, you can't tell very much from a, from a grave like that, but then again, the bones tell you a whole lot and that's exactly how you start the book yeah. saying, yeah. all I have is the bones. So maybe mm -hmm. that's not totally true, right? You had the bones, but you had everything that was in the grave as well. Everything and else too. Plenty yeah. of other clues, but mm -hmm. yeah, no, I really like the way you, you started it off just saying like, this is a story about bones and then it becomes mm -hmm. a story about so much more than that. Um, telling my friends about it, that I was reading this book, everybody was really interested. They were like, wow, cool. seriously? Like, huh? Like they actually thought it mattered. <laughs> like it, it wasn't just like interesting. It was like, huh, that really does change our understanding of history. And that can have an effect on people today. And you know, it's good I to know. I hope it does. I hope it does. Well, thank you so much for chatting sure. with me. Yeah, about it was all nice this. talking to you, Will.